before the homily, just a one announcement. On Friday, our bishop, uh, Bishop Guglielmone, uh, released uh, some uh, updating of the restrictions that had been in place uh, regarding the coronavirus. And so I wanted to just tell you a little bit about that. There's a letter from me in the bulletin that outlines all of the details for how that will affect us here at St. Mary's. I'd like to just very briefly tell you a few things. And of course, first and foremost, as always, your safety and that of your family and friends are of our utmost uh, priority. Of course, at the beginning, uh, we had been listening to the CDC and following the, the science, if you will, and the restrictions that were in place. Now we're also listening to the CDC as we are pretty much uh, re uh, relieving ourselves of those same restrictions. So first of all, to note, uh, the bishop still encourages those, it's not required, but the encourages those who are not fully vaccinated to, to wear a mask, but recognizes the CD says those who are fully vaccinated don't need to do that. And so you certainly do not need to wear one inside here. Also, uh, the sign of peace is coming back, but the bishop doesn't want it full force the way it was. So uh, the way we'll, we'll do it, if it's someone outside of your family unit, maybe, you know, kind of ease back into it. We don't want to, um, you know, scare somebody. So maybe <laughs> wave at them and say, peace be with you, uh, or something like that. Also, there are no restrictions for receiving Holy Communion on the tongue. You can come at any point uh, in, the, in the communion line. Confessions have returned to inside the church building on those days we're hearing those. But the bishop has not yet restored the chalice yet, uh, though that's the only other thing. In summary, pretty much everything has come back except for uh, the chalices. So thank you for your patience as we have been getting through this this past year, a little more than a year. As I put in my, my uh, letter to you, you have had the patience of Job. And I appreciate how kind and patient you have been. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. One of the principal images, one of the main symbols of the Holy Spirit that's reflected in these vibrant uh, red vestments that we're wearing, the symbol of fire, the burning flame of God. God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the one God, presents himself to those gathered in the upper room as tongues of flame that comes down upon their heads, as burning flame. Now think of your, the stories you have heard or read in the Bible, where else you've seen the image of God as flame. Hopefully what can come to mind immediately is the burning bush. You remember when Moses uh, was at, heard God's voice and went to the bush, describing the bush as on fire, yet not consumed. In other words, the bush was on fire, but not destroyed. Here at this moment is where God gave to Moses his very name. I am, he said, I am who am. And at that point, too, he offered Moses his vocation. He offered Moses his mission. And Moses said yes, and his life was changed forever. He came close to the flame, but was not burned, was not consumed, but he was changed. Another place we see God as flame is on the top of Mount Sinai, again with Moses after they have gone into the desert. And on top of Mount Sinai, it's described as God is flame. Moses goes into that flame, but he is not destroyed. What happened here, of course, God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. This outline, if you will, of how his followers would live in the world, but distinct from the world around them. In this case, of course, Moses was not consumed, destroyed, Neither were the Israelites destroyed by the flame, but they were changed. And you and I have inherited the same Ten Commandments from that fiery mountaintop of God. 
we see in God a fire that will change us, but does not consume us, does not annihilate us. It's the fire of, of course, love. God is love, as St. John lovingly reminded us last week. Now, to bring this home, think for a moment of love. Think for a moment the love you have for another person, whether it be your spouse or a friend, a parent, or a child, anyone that you love. We often describe love as a what? A flame, right? And we especially think about that when uh, two people are just getting to know each other and they have this burning love uh, for each other. We talk about that. But really, we likely feel a fiery, faithful love for all the people that we do love. I think sometimes, you know, how you describe a a mother protecting her children like what? Uh, Mama bear protecting her cubs. That's a fiery love, right? If we do it right, meaning that if we love the person without setting them up as an idol, as a rival to God, when we do this love correctly, this fiery love that we have for another does not consume us, but it does change us. Remember, it's the love of God. Now, if we do it wrong, it does consume us. If we put someone else in God's place, if we set up this other person, be it spouse or child or whatever, in the place of God as an idol, then it does consume us and we are left desolate and depressed because the other person did not live up to our expectations. Of course, that's not their fault. They're not God. We are the ones who put them there and ask the impossible of them. Only God can be God. Only God can give us that fiery love. But when it's done right, this love won't consume us, it won't destroy us, but it will change us. Give you another example. You gentlemen out there, all of you gentlemen, think of the life that you had before your wife came into the picture, right? Your bachelor life. And then after meeting her, you were, hopefully, willing to change, right? (laughs) In good ways, of course. Leaving behind your bachelor life, hopefully picking up your clothes much more than you ever did before, even not perfectly now. You were willing to alter yourself. Why? Because you wanted to be with her. You wanted to be with the other, your beloved. Your love for her changed you. Now, you wives out there, hopefully it was similar, though I doubt you had a bachelor life like a lot of guys do. Now, as a priest, I think of my own marriage to the church, Christ that I represent and his bride, the church. My life is so, so different than I had originally imagined it but I fell in love. My bride, the church, certainly has changed me as well as my parishes, my family. They have both changed me, I believe, for the good, for the better. Think now, you parents, about when your first child arrived, when the two suddenly were now three. That love, which is different, changed you. Even with your now sleepless nights and the smelly diapers that you had suddenly, you were willing to put up with all of that for love. You were changed because of this love. The fire of love changed you and made you a better person. And I also think about this. There's so many of you I know who have taken care of or are taking care of elderly parents. It's kind of at the opposite end, isn't it? And that love, that sacrifice, has changed you even now. The Holy Spirit comes to us in a powerful way. But the Holy Spirit does not force himself upon you, or me, or anyone. We must open ourselves and be willing to let the fire of the love of God change us. Be willing to sacrifice ourselves, our pride our plans 
for something so much greater. And every time we do this, every time we do it, the world itself becomes a little less selfish and self-seeking. And when we become that burning beacon of light and hope, then we give the world that's in darkness of fear and prejudice and misunderstandings around us, we give them something to hope for. Who among us in this room does not want to be filled with divine wisdom, understanding, counsel, courage, knowledge, holy fear, and reverence? These are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? They belong to you already. Maybe you need to polish them off or whatever, but at confirmation, you receive them in their fullness. Each of these gifts was given to you for free. These seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, when we live them, then produce within us fruits, the fruits of the Holy Spirit that we heard from St. Paul today. I want to read what he, those he gave us. And I'd like you to listen carefully as I read each of them. As I read each of them, I'll pause, and I'd like you to think of the opposite of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So, for instance, the first one is love, the opposite of which is hate. And then ask yourself the question, which of these two do I want to be filled with? Filled with love, filled with hate. So here they are. Love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do not be afraid. These gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit are already yours. They're already free. And these seven gifts are indispensable resources in the struggle to do one thing, and that is to establish the kingdom on earth. We pray, remember, in the Our Father, not just for the kingdom to come. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that the kingdom can begin even now breaking through even now and we desperately need it if you don't think we need it you haven't been reading the news or looking around you at all these things come from actively engaging in spiritual warfare for God now in the words of one commentator if a person does not bother to equip himself properly for battle he should not be surprised to find himself defenseless when the battle is brought to his doorstep. Folks, we are in a spiritual battle outside of here, perhaps even inside us while we're in here. It's a spiritual battle going on out there, and we need these gifts, fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you and I don't feel like we have the powers that we hoped for after our confirmation, after being confirmed, maybe, just maybe, it's because we never took up arms in the struggle to advance the kingdom of God. We have for far too long been working to advance our own kingdoms, our own desires, our own plans. But the gifts and fruits are not meant for us. They are meant to equip us to forward God's kingdom only. So entrust yourself again today on this wonderful Feast of Pentecost. Entrust yourself to the holy flame of God. Trust him completely. He who promises to change you, yes, but not consume you, not destroy you. Open yourself fully to him and you will find love and patience and gentleness, and faithfulness and, and so much more. And you will find a peace and joy that the world cannot give, nor can it ever take it away from you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Holy Spirit. Let us stand.